like it. I like it. Now we rotate you the right way. Right? Mm. Hi, welcome. Now we missed reading last weekend. Um, so you guys are probably wondering what happens next. Hopefully this light isn't too annoying. As you can see, we are on location post photo shoot. Some very sexy stuff happened in this area coming soon to some, you know, fan only site near you. Um, I, I met a new, uh, sexy model friend and, um, yeah. It was a good day. It was a good day. And now we're going to read some more of this, one of my favorite sci-fi books. It got a, a, it won the Nebula Award. Anyway, chapters one through four already up. Hi, welcome. Let's see, where is chapter five? I didn't post on Twitter that I was going to be doing this. I probably should have. There's number six. You know, I'll probably do chapter six too. I didn't realize chapter five was so short. Here we go. Dogs Among the Roses. Hmm. The strings of wax flowers were all lit now. Red, blue, yellow, white fuzz globes of light swaying overhead. And the music was hot and urgent. A magnetic field in which the revelers swirled and eddied, caught in its invisible lines of force and sent spinning away in a rush of laughter. Among the fantasia, fantasias were lesser costumes, representational rather than interpretive. Angels with carnal smiles, clowns, and sentimental devils with goatees and pitchforks. A satyr stumbled drunkenly by on short stilts, hairy and near naked, waving panpipes to keep from falling. The bureaucrat found Chu behind the bandstand, hustling a red-faced young roisterer. She leaned against him, one palm casually resting on his rump and a teased a paper cup from his hand. No, you don't need any more of that, she said patiently. We could find better uses for the bureaucrat backed away unnoticed. He let the crowd sweep him down the main street of a transformed Rose Hall, past dance stands, rides, and peep shows, pushing through a cluster of surrogates kept to the fringes since they weren't physically present. He watched the Fantasia presentations for a time, shoved up against the stage with a rowdy group of soldiers with central evac armbands who hooted, whistled, and cheered on their favorites. The event was too esoteric for his off-world tastes, and he drifted on through the odors of roast boar, fermented cider, and a dozen fairy foods. Children materialized underfoot and, laughing, were gone. Somebody hailed him by name and the bureaucrat turned to face death. Flickering blue light showed through the sockets of the skull mask and the bureaucrat could see the metal ribs through to the cape. Death handed him a cup of beer. Hi, welcome. And who are you, he said, smiling. Death took his elbow, strolled him away from the bright center of the celebration. Oh, do let me have my mysteries. It's jubilee after all. The tattered black cape Death wore smelled musty. The costumier had taken advantage of his distant customer's limited senses. I'm a friend anyway. They came to a footbridge over the little stream marking the end of town. The light here faded to gloom and the clustered buildings were silent and oppressively dark. Have you located Gregorian yet? The surrogate asked. Just who are you? The bureaucrat asked, not smiling. 
No, of course you haven't. Death looked to the side distractedly. Excuse me, somebody's just... No, I don't have time to. Okay, just leave it right there. Then directly again. I'm sorry about that. Listen, I don't have the time, I'm afraid. Just tell Gregorian when you find him that someone he knows, his sponsor, tell him his old sponsor will take him in again if he gives up this folly. Do you understand? That's what you want too, isn't it? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Why don't you tell me who you are and what you actually want and maybe we can work together in this. No, no. Death shook his head. It's a long shot anyway. Probably won't work. But if you have trouble dealing with him, it's an argument you can use. I mean it. He'll know that my word is good. He turned away. Wait, said the bureaucrat. Who are you? I'm sorry. Are you his father? Death turned to look at him. For a long moment, it said nothing. Then... I'm sorry, I have to leave now. The surrogate swayed as if about to fall, and then locking gyros froze into place, and it stood there, a statue. He touched the metal skull. It was inert, lacking the almost subliminal hum of an active unit. Slowly he walked away, turning now and again to look back, but it remained dead. In the thick of things again, he drained off his spiced beer and picked up a powdered fairy cruller from a drunken teenager who waved away his money. It's been paid for. There was a banner on the stand reading Tidewater Produce and Animal Byproducts Collective. He raised the pastry and toast and wandered away into the fairway again, feeling distant and a trad wistful. All these happy people. The crowd swirled around him as changing, unchanging, as waves craft, crashing on the beach, endlessly fascinating, even as the eye grabs and fails to comprehend. Faces contorted with laughter that was too shrill, too manic, skin too flushed, beaded with sweat. What am I doing here? The bureaucrat asked himself. I'm not going to accomplish anything tonight. The forced gaiety depressed him. The evening was growing late. The children had evaporated and the adults remaining were louder and drunker. Sucking powdered sugar from his fingers, the bureaucrat almost stumbled into a brawl. Two drunks were pushing a surrogate around, flattening its ribs and ripping off its arms and legs one by one. The thing struggled on the ground, protesting loudly as they tore off the last remaining limb, then went dead as the operator gave up on the evening as a bad cause. The bureaucrat skirted the laughing spectators and continued down the road. Woman in a green and blue fantasia, spirit of the waters perhaps, or sky and ocean, emerald plumes flying up from her headdress came towards him. Her costume was cut low and she had to hold up the spangled skirt with one hand to keep it from brushing the ground. The crowd parted like water before her, cleaved by an almost tangible aura of beauty. She looked straight at him, her eyes blazing green as the soul of a forest. Nearby, a chanteuse sang that the heart was like a little bird looking for a nest. She set the crowd swirling like brightly painted metal bobbins. The green woman was swept to him, a mermaid cast up by the sea. Automatically, the bureaucrat took a step backward to let this vision by. But she stopped him with a gentle touch of one green leather glove. You, she said, and those green eyes and crisp white teeth seemed about to tear into him. I want you. She put an arm about his waist and led him away. By the edge of the jubilee, the woman paused to pluck a wax flower from one sagging string. She cupped it in both hands and bent at a stream's edge to place it in the water. Other flowers bobbed and whirled on the stream, spinning slowly, a stately ballroom dance. As she crouched over the sphere of light, he saw that her arms above the gloves were covered with stars and triangles, snakes and eyes, Gnostic tattoos of uncertain meaning. Her name, she said, 
was Undine. They strolled down Cheese Factory Road, beyond the rucks of houses, deep into a forest of roses. Thorny vines were everywhere. They climbed pillars formed by trees that had been choked by their profusion, sprawled along the ground, exploded into blood-speckled bushes large as hills. The air was heavy with their scent, almost cloying. I should have trimmed these back some, the woman said as they ducked under a looping arch of small pink flowers. But so close to the Jubilee Tides, who'd bother? Are these native? asked the bureaucrat, amazed at their extent. The flowers were everywhere he looked. Oh no, these are feral earth stock. The original industrielle had them planted along the roadside. She liked their look. But without any natural enemies, they just exploded. This extends, oh, kilometers around. On the Piedmont, they'd be a problem. Here, the tides will just wash them away. They walked some way in silence. You're a witch, the bureaucrat said suddenly. Oh, you've noticed. He could feel her amused smile burning in the night air beside him. The tip of her tongue touched the edge of his ear gently traced the swirls down its dark center, withdrew. When I heard you were looking for Gregorian, I decided to have a look at you. I studied with Gregorian when we were children. Ask me anything you want. They came to a clearing in the rose bushes and a small unpainted hut. Here we are. Will you tell me where Gregorian is? That's not what you want. <laughs> the smile again, those unblinking green eyes, not at the moment. This must have a thousand eyelets, he said clumsily, unhooking the back of her fantasia. A slice of flesh appeared just below the downy nape of Undine's neck, widened, reached downward. The tips of his fingers brushed pale skin and she shivered slightly. A single wax flower burned on the nightstand beneath a sentimental hollow of Krishna dancing. The flame leapt and fell, throwing warm shadows through the room. There, that's the last of them. The witch turned, reached hands to shoulders, lowered the gown. Large breasts, the faintest trifle overripe, floated into view, tipped with apricot nipples. Slowly, she let the cloth slip down over a full, soft belly, its deep navel a swim in shadow. A tuft of hair appeared, and laughing, she held the dress so that only the very topmost hint of her vagina showed. Oh, the heart is like a little bird, she sang softly, swaying in time to the music that perches in your hair. The woman was a trap. <laughs> the bureaucrat could feel it. Gregorian had his hook set in her just below the skin. If he were to kiss her, the barbs would pierce his own flesh, too deep and painful to rip out. And the magician would be able to play him like a fish, wearing him down, tiring him out, until he lost the will to fight and sank to the bottom of his life and died. And if you do not seize it, she was waiting. He should lead now. He should turn and flee. Instead, he reached for her face, touched it lightly, wonderingly. Her lips turned to his and they kissed deeply. The costume rustled as it fell to the floor. His hands reached inside his jacket to undo his shirt. Don't be so gentle, she said. They tumbled into the bed, and she slid him within her. She was wet and open already, slippery and warm and fine. Her soft, wide belly touched him, then her breasts. She was just past her prime, poised on the instant before the long slide into age, and especially arousing to him for that. She'll never be so beautiful again, he thought, so ripe and full of juices. She clasped her legs about his waist and rocked him like a ship on the water, 
gently at first, then faster as if a storm were building. Undine, he thought for no reason. Isol, Esme, Theodora, the woman here have names like dried flowers or autumn leaves. A gust of wind sent the flower light scurrying for the corners, hurrying back again. Undine kissed him furiously on the face, the neck, the eyes, the bed creaking beneath them. They rolled over and over one another, now on the bottom, now on the top, and over again until he lost track of who was on top and who was on bottom, or where his body ended and hers began, or exactly of which body belonged to whom. And then at last she was ocean herself and he lost all sense of self and drowned. <laughs> Again, she said, I'm afraid you've mistaken me for somebody else. The bureaucrat said amiably, someone considerably younger. But if you're willing to wait 20 minutes or so, I'll be more than happy to try again. She sat up, her magnificent breasts swaying slightly. Faint daggers of Caliban's light slanted through the window to touch them both. The candle had long since guttered out. You mean to say you don't know the method by which men can have orgasm after orgasm without ejaculating? He laughed. No. <laughs> the girls won't like you if you have to stop a half hour every time you come. She said teasingly. Then seriously, I'll teach you. She took his cock in her hand, waggled it back and forth, amused by its limpness. After your vaunted 20 minutes, in the meantime, I can show you something of interest. She threw the blanket lengthwise over her shoulders as if it were a shawl. It made a strange costume in the dim light with sleeves that touched the ground and a back that didn't quite reach her legs, so that two pale slivers of moon peeped out at him. Naked, he padded after her into the clearing behind the hut. Look, she said. Light was bursting from the ground in pale sheets of pink and blue and white. The rose bushes shimmered with pastel light as if already drowned in ocean shallows. The ground here had been dug up recently, churned and spaded, and was now suffused with pale fire. What is it? he asked wonderingly. Iridobacterium. They're naturally biophosphorescent. You'll find them everywhere in the soil on the tidewater, but usually only in trace amounts. They're useful if this, uh, in the spiritual arts. Pay attention now, because I'm going to explain a very minor mystery to you. I'm listening, he said, not comprehending. The only way to force a bloom is to bury an animal in the soil. When it decomposes, the iridobacteria feed on the products of decay. I've spent the last week poisoning dogs and burying them here. You killed dogs, he said, horrified. It was quick. What do you think is going to happen to them when the tide comes? They're like the roses. They can't adapt. So the Humane Society people organized dog control week and paid me by the corpse. Nobody's about to haul a bunch of mutts to the Piedmont, she gestured. There's a shovel leaning against my hut. He fetched the shovel. In a month, this land would be underwater. He imagined fishes swimming through the buildings while drowned dogs floated, mouths open, caught head down in tangles of drowning rose bushes. They would rot before the hungry kings of the tide would accept their carcasses. At the witch's direction, he shoveled the brightest patches of dirt into a rusty steel drum almost filled with rainwater. The dirt sank and the bright swirls of phosphorescence rose in the water. Undine skimmed the top with a wooden scraper, slopping the scum into a wide pan. When the water evaporates, the powder that remains is rich in iridobacterium, she said. There's several more steps necessary to process it, but now it's in concentrated form that can wait until I reach the Piedmont. It's common as sin now, but it won't grow up there. Tell me about Gregorian, the bureaucrat said. 
Gregorian is the only perfectly evil man I've ever met, Undine said. Her face was suddenly cold, as harsh and stern as Caliban's rocky plains. He is smarter than you, stronger than you, more handsome than you, and far more determined. He has received an off-planet education that's at least equal of yours, and he's a master of occult arts in which you do not believe. You are insane to challenge him. You are a dead man, and you do not know it. He'd certainly like me to believe that. All men are fools, Undyne said. Her tone was light again, her look disdainful. Have you noticed that? Were I in your position, I'd arrange to contract an illness or develop a moral qualm about the nature of my assignment. It might be a black mark on my record, but I would outlive the embarrassment. When did you meet Gregorian? The bureaucrat dumped more dirt in the drum, raising mad swirls of phosphorescence. Ah, that was the year I spent as a ghost. I was a foundling. Madame Compospi bought me the year before I first bled. She'd seen promise in me. I was a shy, spooky little thing to begin with, and as part of my training, she imposed the discipline of invisibility. I kept to the shadows, never speaking. I slept at odd times and in odd places. When I was hungry, I crept into the homes of strangers and stole my food from their cupboards and plates. If I was seen, Madame beat me. But after the first month, I was never seen. That sounds horribly cruel. You are in no position to judge. I was watching from the heart of an ornamental umbrella bush the morning that Madame tripped over Gregorian literally tripped. He was sleeping on her doorstep. I learned later that he'd walked two days solid without food. He was so anxious to become her apprentice and then collapsed on arrival. What a squawk. She kicked him into the road and I think he broke a rib. I climbed to the roof of her potting shed and saw her harass him out of sight. Quick as a thought, I slid to the ground, stole a turnip from my breakfast from the garden and was gone, thinking that was the last of the ragged young man. But the next day he was back. She chased him away. He came back. Every morning it was the same. He scrounged for food during the day. I did not know if he stole work or sold his body, for I was not quite interested enough to follow him. Though by now I could walk down the center of Rose Hall in broad daylight without being noticed. But every morning he was back on the stoop. After a week she changed tactics. When she found him on the door sill, she would throw some small change. The little ceramic coins that were current then, the orange and green and blue chips, they've gone back to silver since. She treated him as a beggar because you see, he held himself very proudly and there was a dirty gray trace of lace at the cuffs of his rag. She could tell he was haute bourgeois. She thought to shame him away but he'd snatched the coins from the air, popped them into his mouth, and very ostentati ostentatiously swallow. Madame pretended not to notice. From the attic window of the beautician's shop across the street, I watched this duel between her stiff back and his nasty grin. A few days later, I noticed a horrible smell by the stoop and discovered that he'd been shitting behind the topiary bushes. It was a foul heap of his weaving studded with the ceramic coin that she had been throwing him. So that finally, Madame had no choice but to take him in. Why? Because he had the spirit of a magician. He had that unswerving, unbreakable will that the spiritual arts require and the sudden instinct for the unexpected. Madame could no more ignore him than a painter could ignore a child with perfect visualization. Such a gift only comes along once in a generation. She tested him. You are familiar with the device used to give the experience of food to surrogates? The line feed, yes, very familiar. She had one mounted in a box. An off-world lover had wired it up for her. It was stripped down so that she could feed raw current into the nerve inductor. Do you know how it would feel to hold your hand within its field. It would hurt like hell. Like hell indeed, she smiled sadly. 
and he could see the ghost of a schoolgirl behind the smile. I remember that box so well. A plain thing with a hole in one side and a rheostat on top calibrated from one to seven. If I close my eyes, I can see it and her long fingers atop it and that damned water rat of hers perched on her shoulder. She warned me that if I took my hand out of the box before she told me to, she would kill me. It was the most terrifying moment of my life. Even Gregorian, ingenious though he was, could never top that. Undyne skimmed more slop off the water. Her voice was soft and reminiscent. When she moved the dial off zero, it felt like an animal had bitten right through the, my flesh. Then slowly, oh, excruciatingly slowly, she moved it up to one. And that was an order of magnitude worse. What agonies I suffered. I was crying aloud by three and blind with pain by four. At five, I yanked out my hand, determined to die. She gave me a hug then and told me she had never seen anyone do so well and that I would someday be more famous than she. For a long moment, the witch was silent. I slipped through an open window and into the next room when Madame led Gregorian in. More silent than a wraith, I drifted from shadow to shadow, leaving not the echo of a footfall behind. I left the door open one finger span so I could peer from darkness into light. Then I retreated to a closet within the second room. Through the crack of the door, I could see their distant reflections in the mantel mirror. Gregorian was skinny, barefoot, and dirty. I remember thinking how insignificant he looked alongside Madame Kapaski's aristocratic figure. Madame set him down by the hearth, a murmur of voices as she explained the rules. She drew away the fringed cloth that covered the box. Cocky as a crow, he placed his hand within. I saw his face jump, that involuntary hop of muscles when she first touched the dial. I saw how pale he grew, how he trembled as she increased the pain. He did not take his eyes off of her. She took him all the way up to seven. His body was rigid, his fingers spasming, but his head held straight and unforgiving, and he had not blinked. I think even Madame feared him then, sitting there in his ragged clothes, his eyes burning like lanterns. I was so still, my heart did not beat. My immobility was perfect, but somehow Gregorian knew. His head rose and he looked in the mirror. He saw me and he grinned, a horrible grin, a skull's grin, but a grin nonetheless. And I knew then that try though she might, she would never break him. I'm done now, she set a piece of cheesecloth over the tray and the bureaucrat followed her back inside. Slim crescent moons winking at him one after the other from beneath the blanket. What's it good for? He asked when they were both seated on the bed again, facing each other cross-legged, her vagina a sweet dark shadow within the protective circle of her legs. The powder you make from dogs. We mix it with ink and inject it beneath the skin. She rotated a hand before his face. The shadows, in the shadows it was colorless, unmarked. Each design represented a ritual the woman of power is entitled to perform, and every ritual represents knowledge, and all knowledge properly applied is control. Suddenly, a marking on her hand flared into light. It was a small fish, visible through the skin. Turning the markings on and off at will is a reminder of that control. One by one, the tattoos flickered on, a pyramid, a vulture, a wreath of cock. Stars flared into subdermal novae and struck fire to serpents, to moons, to alchemical elements. 
Mirandan microflora is all but incompatible with Terran biology. And injected beneath the skin, they can get enough nourishment to stay alive, but not enough to grow. There they stay starving and comatose until I awaken them. Now the tattoos were all aglow. They climbed her arms almost to her shoulders. How do you do that? Oh, that's one of the very first things you learn, how to raise the temperature of your body. Here, she lifted one of his hands. It takes next to nothing. Concentrate on your fingertips. Will them to be warmer. Think of hot things. Try to make them hot. She waited, then said, well, his fingertips tingled. I I'm not sure. You think it's just power of suggestion. A tiny starburst appeared at the tip of her finger, floated before his eyes. This is the first marking I received. Turn your finger hot, the goddess said, and it burst into life. I was so amazed. I felt then that my life had taken a great turn, that nothing would ever be the same again. She was touching his leg gently, sliding fingers slowly up, rapidly down. Stroke, stroke, stroke. What goddess said? When someone teaches you that which is of spiritual value, you do not learn such things from a human. The person partakes of divinity, becomes as one with the Godhead. Thus, when Madame Kapaspi taught Gregorian and me, she was to us the goddess. Her hand reached up to stroke his penis, which Almost without his noticing, it had grown hard and aroused again. Well, it's time for me to be your goddess now. She lay back, legs wide, and drew him atop her. I want to talk about Gregorian, the bureaucrat said uncertainly. She had him by both hands now and was sliding him into her warm depths. No reason we can't do both. She clasped him tight and rolled him over so that she sat on top. The ritual you are about to learn from the goddess, the way of controlling ejaculation, is known as the worm Ouroboros. After the great serpent of earth, which eats its own tail forever and is replenished thereby, a perfect closed system, such as does not exist on the mundane realm, not even your floating metal cities. She moved up and down on him slowly, gracefully as a swan in moon glimmer, and he reached up to caress her breasts. It has physical benefits that extend beyond the obvious and is an excellent introduction into the tantric mysteries. What specifically do you want to know about Gregorian? His hands slid down the front of her body touched gently the tip of her pinkness, moved to clasp her as she eased herself down on him, nipples, breasts, belly, chin. I want to know where I can find him. Somewhere down river, I'd guess. People say he has a permanent place in Ararat, but who can say? He doesn't really need a permanent address because he never allows people to find him. What about the people who pay to be changed into sea dwellers? They don't find him, he finds them. He's looking for a special sort of person, isn't he? Anxious to stay in the tide water, willing to change into a non-human shape to do so, ready to be convinced by Gregorian's commercial and rich enough to pay his prices. I'm sure he had a sucker list drawn up a long time ago. When did you see him last? Oh, it was years and years ago. Her teeth played with his earlobe. Her breath was warm on his cheek. He was headed for ocean when he finally left Madame, but he got no further than Heliostat Station 17. He met someone there, and next anybody heard he was off planet. Do you like this? Her nails ran lightly up his sides. Yes. Good. She put her hands at the base of his spine, and abruptly raked them up his back. He arced involuntarily, sucking in air. She'd left stinging tracks upon his skin. 
You like that too, and it surprises you, doesn't it? I learned that with Gregorian. He became a god and taught me how to close pleasure and pain, taught me how close pleasure and pain lie to each other. She laughed at him, but one lesson for evening. Pull out of me and lie down. I have something to show you. She guided him over on his side, gently lifted one of his knees and lowered her head between his legs. Playfully, she kissed the tip of his penis, slid her tongue down its stalk, teased his balls with her lips. Down here, this soft spot midway between your scrotum and your anus, she tickled it with her tongue. Can you feel it? Yes. Good. Ease your left hand down here. No, from behind. That's good. Now push at the spot I just showed you with the tips of your forefinger and middle finger. A little harder. Just so. She reared up on her knees. Now I want you to breathe in deeply the way I do. Not from the lungs, but from the abdomen. She demonstrated and the bureaucrat smiled at the solemn beauty of her breasts in the pale moonlight. Gently but firmly, she moved his hand away. It's your turn now. Sit up for this. Draw in deeply and slowly. He obeyed. From the stomach, he tried again. That's the way. She leaned back on her hands, put her legs about his waist and drew him close. This time, I want you to pay attention to your body. When you feel ready to ejaculate, not when it's already begun, but just before, reach back and push down on yourself as I showed you. At the same time, breathe in deeply, slowly. It should take about four seconds. She waved a hand back and forth slowly four times, counting out the beats like that. You can slow down while you're doing that, but don't stop entirely, okay? If you sense, if you say so, the bureaucrat said dubiously. The tip of his cock was touching her. Undine steadied it and slid forward atop it. Ah, she said. Then, you think it's too easy that if something so simple were as effective as I say, your mommy would have told you about it, eh? Well, whether you believe me or not is of no importance. As long as you do as I say, you can postpone ejaculation indefinitely. He clasped her tightly, lay back beneath her. I think... <laughs> he followed the exercise faithfully listening to his body and stopping the ejaculation whenever it threatened the moon rocked crazily through the window then an astonishing thing happened shortly after one of the near ejaculations he had an orgasm the sensation took him and he cried out seizing undine with all his strength and felt the small taste of god wash through him then the orgasm was through and he hadn't come yet. He was still erect and strangely clear-headed, preternaturally aware and alert. What was that? He asked in amazement. Now you understand, Undyne said. Orgasm is more than just a squirt of salt fluid. She was moving atop him like a ship in the swell just before the storm, her eyes half-lidded, her mouth open slightly. She licked her lips, smiled almost jeeringly. Her hair and breasts were sweaty. <laughs> you haven't mentioned Gregorian recently. Have you run out of questions? Just the opposite, I'm afraid. He played with one breast, tracing circles about the aureole, lightly tugging at the nipple with the thumb and forefinger. My questions multiply with each answer. I don't understand why your mistress mistreated Gregorian so, why she tried to break him with pain. Surely that was counterproductive. <sighs> with Gregorian it was, she agreed. But had it worked, there's really no way to make you understand this without undergoing a similar experience. You'll have to take my word for it. But when the goddess claims your life, the first thing she has to do is shatter your old world. 
in order to force you into the larger universe. The mind is lazy. It's comfortable where it is and can only be driven into reality with pain or fear. But this is never done with malice, but with love. At the end of her test, Madame hugged me. I thought she despised me. I believed I was about to die, and then she hugged me. I can't tell you how good that hug felt. Better than anything we've done tonight. Better than anything I've ever felt before. I cried. I felt wrapped in love, and I knew I would do anything to be worthy of it. I would have died for that woman in an instant. But this didn't happen with Gregorian. No. She rocked slightly from side to side, moving him within her. She never broke Gregorian. She tried many times, and each failed attempt made him stronger and more savage. And that's why he's going to kill you. Abruptly, she rolled him atop her. For a second, he was afraid he'd hurt her with his weight. Well, in the meantime, she said, I have my own uses for you. He had four more orgasms before he finally came, and that final time was an order of magnitude more intense than anything he'd ever felt before. He did not so much fall asleep as pass out. When he awoke, Undyne was gone. Groggily, he looked about the room. The furniture remained and a few discarded oddments. The Fantasia lay on the floor, sad and a little tattered, several of the long rainbird plumes already broken. But there was an emptiness, a sense of abandonment about the room. All personal touches were gone. He dressed and left. It was late in the morning. Prospero was already high in the sky and the town was empty. Doors hung open. Bed things lay where they'd been flung in the grass. The husks of last night's fantasias littered the streets like abandoned cicada shells. The bureaucrat stole back, strolled back to the center of Rose Hall, head clearing slowly, and he felt like singing. His body ached but pleasantly. His cock felt pink and raw. All he needed was a good breakfast to put him right with the world. Chu stood by a truck with the newborn king painted on the fender and Arshag Mentushin's string theater in a lucerium of heaven and hell, the 10 million cities, the 11 worlds in seven garish colors on the van sidewall. The bureaucrat remembered seeing it last night, shutters open, and a puppet play in progress. Chu was talking to a fat, sweaty man with a fastidious little mustache. Arshag Mentushin himself, evidently. Have a good night, she asked, and abruptly burst into laughter. The bureaucrat stared at her in astonishment. Then Mentushin, too, began laughing. The bureaucrat stared... Wait... What the hell's so funny? The bureaucrat demanded, offended. Your hand, Chu said. I see you've had a night to remember. Then they were off again, the two of them soared aloft on gusts of laughter like kites. The bureaucrat looked at his hand. There was a fresh new tattoo there, a serpent that circled the middle finger of his left hand three times and then took its tail in its mouth. <laughs> Oh, that was chapter five. That's a good one. <laughs> I don't know if I can read chapter six tonight. I'm exhausted and now I'm a little distracted. <laughs> chapter six is lost in the mushroom rain. Oh. oh, do I have a bookmark? I actually have a bookmark in here. It was extra steamy. Oh, hey, Cody. Yeah. 
I have a friend that does tattoos and she uh, can do glow in the dark tattoos and they're invisible until you hit it with a UV light. And I seriously, I had already read this um, when she started doing that. So I bought her this book and I was like, girl, I'm going to have to get some witch tattoos. <laughs> Oh, I want to do chapter six, but I don't want um, my friend to interrupt when he gets back from his show. What time is it? What time is it, you guys? It's 9.30 here. Um, that was a short one. I think I'm going to have to wait. They look so short and then they take me 45 minutes. Yeah, you need to go to bed. It's late over there, isn't it, Ace? Hmm. I'm gonna um I don't know, maybe I have to go live on my other um <clears throat> thing. I hear people outside. Outside it's Saturday night in Seattle, and I'm um I'm, I'm reading fun, saucy stuff. Thanks for joining me. Mm. I am wearing clothes down here somewhere. The string counts, right? I already got an 18 plus channel. What else can they do? I've got clothes on. They can't ban me, right? 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 was the light. You're welcome. We'll have to do chapter six and seven next weekend. Hey, Daniel. Mm. Got my itty bitty teeny weeny tiny red bikini. I'm a uh, I'm very distracted now. I think that's my favorite chapter. <clears throat> There's other good chapters, but that one's my favorite. No idea why. Hmm. Gee, I don't know why. <laughs> It had nothing to do with an extra steamy photo shoot earlier. Um, yeah, no. Mm, mm, mm. It got really hot in here. In fact, it's still really hot in here. Is it cold there? It's like ridiculous summer weather here still. I hope you get the, some good use out of that scarf though. It just, um, yeah, it just had to wait around my place for like two and a half years before I mailed it. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys. Oh, I've never gone live on OF. Maybe I should try that next. I brought my rainbow friend. Can't do that on YouTube. We'll see. Somewhere in the universe, the multiverse, there's an alternate timeline where the prudes didn't take over. And then, you know... YouTube wouldn't be like, YouTube would be like OnlyFans and OnlyFans wouldn't exist. That's my opinion. Thank you. I'm feeling cute. This is my post photo shoot. Just threw something on and didn't care. My hair is finally long enough to put in a ponytail so I can get up to my shenanigans. And the, you know what they say, the higher the ponytail the crazier the girl. We got it. We got it pretty high up today. Not ultimate psycho. That's up here. You know, 
if I was feeling more reserved, it'd be down, but yeah. I'll be back home tomorrow. Oh, I got an early train to catch. Mm, man, I didn't think about that. Um, I guess I'm gonna get coffee on the train. Yeah, I didn't think anybody would complain about this outfit. Mm. I had to cover it up. See, I'm being modest. I covered it up. I miss live streaming. Oh my gosh, I miss my cam days. The new apartment is, is awesome so far. I got a bunch more stuff in before I left for Seattle. I got two more car loads. Um, and I got all my plants and like, I, I don't have all my books. Like I still, the truck had to reschedule to Monday. So, um, uh, I've got to go tomorrow. I need someone to go with me so I can pack safely. And, and I have people coming on Monday to help me pack and move. The rest of my stuff but it's so nice in my new apartment it's so nice i already played my guitar there and stuff it's great got the wi-fi fixed right before i left very happy last night you know i'm in seattle and i just feel like getting out of the city was such a good thing like i slept so good last night oh my gosh Oh, like I said, I think I'll try to do this on the weekends. I'll try to do the next chapter or two next weekend. Yeah, yeah. And like right now I have to worry about people coming back because this isn't my place. But then when I'm at my apartment, I just have to worry about the neighbors being super loud. But nobody's going to like walk in and be crazy or like get upset that I'm you know, reading or doing something fun or like smiling too much. Why are you so happy? Is that, is that a problem? <laughs> Yay, no more roommates. <sighs> Gosh, I feel tired. Okay. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing next. I actually need to shower and get this makeup off. I still have makeup on. So, yeah, I probably have to get all my stuff together and be ready for a very early train ride tomorrow. But yeah, thanks for joining me. And um, yeah, if you're not hooked before, then like, I mean, Right? This is like a mystery novel combined with sci-fi. Like, I love it. I love it. Ugh. Love it. Have a great rest of your Saturday. And, um, I'll just, I'll just update whatever I update whenever I update it. You're welcome. Fun, fun, fun. Oh. Reminds me of the days when I used to fall asleep on cam. Let's not fall asleep. <laughs> Let's not fall asleep on live, shall we? All right, I'm going now for now. For real, for bye, for real.